So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for this tutorial. So today's tutorial is another one of our weekly AFP session. It's on white space questions given to us by Dr. Demetrius. Um, just a few rules if you're watching via Zoom. If you've got any questions or comments that are covered in the moment, if you just want to pop it into the chat. Um, any questions that can wait until the end or a bit general, if you just want to leave it and put it into the Q&A. If you're watching on the Facebook Live, if you just want to comment your questions or comments and I'll pass them on to the tutor. Um, that's all from me now. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Dimitris. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitris Karponis, and I'm an Academic Foundation Year One doctor. So basically graduated in the year of COVID, and this is my first job. Um, so today I'll have the pleasure of going through with you um, on details and tips and tricks on how to ace the white space questions. Uh, now, um, I'm just going to say that I know it's a bit late in the day and you've got better things to do. So I'm going to keep this short and sweet. If there's anything I didn't cover at the end, um, just drop me a message on the chat box and I'll reply to everything at the end, um, as many questions as time allows. So, okay, so a brief disclaimer, the views that I'll present here on my own um, and I don't work for becoming a doctor and um, I'm not affiliated uh, with any AFP deaneries or any, anything like that. So I'm not an insider in that sense. I've just been through the process and I'm just here to share my experience with you and I hope you guys find it helpful. Okay, um, just to have a bit of a structure, um, not that this is a lecture, but just to have some things in mind to take away from this. The purpose of this is to understand the reasoning behind white space questions so you can answer them more confidently, to develop a framework for answering them, and finally we'll go through some examples uh, just so to give you some ideas on what you can potentially write to your white space questions and how you can approach them. Now the first question is why do we have white space questions, right? Deaneries can have up to six different white space questions, which is a lot because each one is over 200 words and it's a lot for you to write, but it's also a lot for them to review, right? So what's the point of them? And the truth is it's like a pre-interview stage. So they're conducting a second interview before the interview because they're trying to see who actually wants it, who really wants to join the foundation program. They want to see whether your reasons for applying are legit, so to speak. So they don't have a lot of time during interview day and they you have to look at it from a practical perspective like paying a different panel and scheduling people especially now with covid but i'm sure it will happen online but you know all those time slots and uh, it's difficult to arrange interviews for many uh, candidates so the deaneries don't want to devote that time and they think that the best way to screen is through white space questions Many people think that white space questions are a good place to sell yourself. This is true, but it's only half the truth. I like to think of them as a, an opportunity to sell yourself, absolutely. But um, I would approach them with caution because they're an opportunity for the deanery to catch you out and you don't want to make a bad impression. So there's what, six times say 200 so there's over a thousand and two hundred words you can write um, about you, about your achievements. So there's a lot of room for mistakes. There's a lot of room for leaving stuff unclear and they'll pick up on that on the interview or even before that they won't call you for an interview. So I'd say be very careful with what you write down. Okay, if you were to take one thing from this talk, this is the slide. Um, this is the most important slide. So my top tips for white space questions. Number one, the most important one, rewrite and resend. So this isn't a cliche. The best way to do well in white space questions is by drafting them. So I applied to two different deaneries um, and finally chose Oxford. I received offers from both, but I remember for Oxford, I had about seven or eight drafts. So I put a lot of work in my white space questions. Um, and if you put a lot of work in shows because you've seen it through many different times. You've changed it. You've sent it to your friends. So always send it to your friends and uh, uh, be responsive to feedback. Don't be dismissive. See 
the feedback as an opportunity. Take on board what your friends are suggesting, especially your friends applying to other AFPs as well. They're a good source because they know the process and um, trust your friends, basically. Um, use personal examples. So they go through all sorts of questions by so many different candidates. And you can imagine how boring it can be reading the same thing over and over again, like a clinical scenario or anything like that. Approach it like a personal statement. So go back five or six years when you, um, and, uh, when you were applying to medical school and think about that thing that made you stood out, that really showed your passion and talks a little bit about yourself because they want to find out about who they're going to interview. They like to do their research on you just as you research the college or the interviewer before the interview. Think of it as their way of knowing who you are. Structure-wise, this will help you more for the interview, but there's also a good structure to keep in mind for the white space questions. Use different frameworks that work for you, like the STAR or the CAMP mnemonic frameworks. I'm sure you've seen them before. Um, if not, you can Google them. They're helpful for the interviews, maybe for white space questions as well. I'd say the most important thing structure-wise is don't forget to include personal examples. And finally, what I mean by strategy. So there's plenty of uh, white space questions, depending on the deanery. Sometimes they do have some overlap. The overlap is there for a reason. They want to see whether you've done that one thing and that's the only thing you can brag about or you've done a couple of things and you can actually blend them in nicely. So before writing any questions, go through them a couple of times. Just read, just read the, the questions to them a couple of times um, and make sure you know all the questions by heart without having to look at that question seat. So you know that when you answer question one, question two will be this, question three will be that so that you already have in mind what examples you're gonna use for each question. In a way, um, I want you guys to answer the questions in your head before starting to write the answer for the first question. And that helps because it shows a dedicated person, it shows a person who's done their homework, done their plan and knows themselves, knows what they're good at and how to sell themselves. Okay, um, let's see how many of you are awake. <laughs> What's the maximum number of white space questions per deanery? <laughs> well done. Um, awake person, yeah, it's six. Very academic question, uh, no point at all, but just to see if you guys are awake. Right, so. Taylor fans unite. Um, we're going to go through some tips on how to best answer uh, white space questions. And I'm going to go through a f a f an example of um, a framework. So we're going to use the Oxford white space questions. I know some of you are applying to London. London doesn't have white space questions. Oxford is, I think, the next most popular deanery. So I thought this would be a good example. But what I'm going to say doesn't apply to Oxford only. I'm just going to use Oxford as an example. This is generalizable to all white space questions. Okay, so um, the first question is, how would training in this AFP contribute to your overall career planning? Um, and this is sort of an interview question. They don't have time on interview day to ask you, why do you want to do AFP? Why do you want to be in Oxford or whatever dinner you want to be in? Um, so they ask you this. And um, in a way you have to answer as if it were an interview. So try and include everything, but you can leave a few cues for them to pick up on the interview if they do decide to ask you uh, on this question. So look up your deanery. In, in particular, Oxford has plenty of perks. So um, it gives you the liberty to choose your own supervisor. So I like that. So I wrote that down. Um, it's got some good research links, um, close with industry, close with the, the universities are very close with research centers. Um, it's got a lot of seminars every day. Um, you've got different experts speaking in different colleges. And then there are some other perks that are specific to um, its um, deanery. So for example, Oxford uh, has UCAGS, which is the Oxford University Clinical Academic Graduate School. Um, which are really great for us because they do give us some funding and some access to some courses, some conferences, which are usually harder to get. But it's not just UCAGS. Wherever you are, 
search for the clinical academic department and they will have some perks and they will have some benefits and write those benefits down. And then you can also end this question by saying, oh, you know what, I want to do an AFP, not only because I enjoy research, but because I actually want to do an ACF, which is an academic clinical fellowship later on, or I want to do a, a PhD, or I want to become a clinical lecturer. So show that you've you've made a vision of yourself a couple of years down the line. It doesn't matter if this is uh, not the case. You shouldn't lie. You should think of what you want to become in that particular moment. So if you think you enjoy research and you would like to continue or you would possibly like to do a PhD, go for it. Write that down. It gives you marks. Okay, next question. So list one example of research um, uh, or of uh, or teaching experience and why is it significant to your application um again this is another oxford question but commonly asked in many deaneries what do they want here is they don't really care about the research placement per se so how do you compare a research project in america from a research project somewhere in europe from some teaching project um in the uk you can't really and they don't really want to look at the outcome they want to look at what you learned from it and how you are a better person than you were before it um, research wise or teaching wise so show some initiative if you have an example like that if not it's fine present a challenging example and how you adapted and overcame those challenges and how you managed to balance the demands and achieve the intended outcome so basically show how you tackled it and how you developed through it um, give a bit of an explanation of what you had to do, so um, just the fundamentals, so if it was a lab, what techniques you learned, who you worked with, don't go into too much detail though, because the essence of this answer is to show what you've done and what you've learned and how you, you've grown as a person from it. Um, and uh, the last line particularly important here, so I know, I know this sounds a bit far-fetched, but they really want to see you adapting and overcoming a challenge is a lot more important than getting a paper. Okay, maybe not in science, but you know, getting a paper out there. I like science, science is a good journal. Okay, next question. A time uh, when you successfully identified, um, when you worked successfully in a team and identify your role and contribution to that team's success. So they've moved from why you want to do an AFP to why and how you dealt with a with a with a challenging situation in the past to something similar but in a team based um, sort of approach, which is important because during an AFP you're going to be working in teams and they want to see that not only you're a good leader or solo player but you work well with your with your colleagues. So um, I've written a bit of my personal example here. So um, I did go to Japan for my BSc, but I didn't write it like this. I went to Tokyo, Japan for three months to research, blah, blah, blah. This isn't doing justice to the project. You're just stating it. You're not selling yourself. You have to, you have to sell yourself. So if you went through an interview to get that position, say it, say that it was a competitive research ship. Say that, um, you know, many people applied for it and you got it. Say that you got funding. Um, these things aren't, gi aren't given. I know they are for you and for people from your university or people who apply to that program, but Program directors at Oxford or wherever you apply don't know this. So make sure you sell yourself and don't undersell yourself. And again, as with the previous question, you've noticed a trend here. Use personal examples and show how you, you've grown as a, as a person, as a researcher, as a teacher, how you overcame those, the hurdles that uh, you know, the opportunity presented. So in my case, um, in Japan, there was a huge language barrier. It was very difficult to communicate. I, <laughs> I initially relied on Google Translate, um, which sounds crazy, but it did work. Um, I worked in a team of engineers and mathematicians, so it was difficult being the only clinically oriented uh, academic there. So it was very interesting seeing the cultural differences. It was all eye-opening, really. Um, but you know, all this difference and uh, all, all this uh, sort of unique setting and the, the different culture really pushed me to to try and achieve something because I was worried I wouldn't make anything out of it because of the difficulties. So I persevered, um, was 
diligent at the tasks I was given, um, sometimes went in early, left later, just to catch up and make sure that the language barrier and the other hurdles wouldn't stop us. Uh, and then at the end, um, we did put down a paper um, and send it and it got published. So if you did get a publication out of it, well done, that's good. They don't really care. They just want to see that, you know, you've, you work well in the team and um, you've done what you could. And uh, yeah. So uh, next question, penultimate question. So what teaching and research skills um, for, are, are you going to take away from this AFP that you don't currently have? Now, this is a tricky question. I don't know if it's universal and stuff, but this was one of the ones I wasn't quite sure about how to answer when I was applying for Oxford, because what is it asking here? Skills that you don't have, um, skills that you want to take away. You've got to find sort of a balance you don't want to be defensive here and say, oh, I know nothing, um, uh, which is true. There's people in these programs that know a lot more than we do, but uh, they don't care about that. They care about the enthusiasm to, to learn. Remember guys, like success is, is like a habit, trying to be slightly better than you were yesterday, trying to be better than your yesterday self, basically. So showing that you want to improve and that you know where the resources are, that's what they want to see. So Oxford wise, um, I had to choose something that was good in Oxford. So something I could find in Oxford and something that's of interest to me. And one of these things was MedEd. Oxford's big on uh, evidence-based teaching methods, evidence-based in general. Um, and they have plenty of different societies like their, their fellows. So I talked about that uh, and I said, you know what, I've already done some teaching. I don't consider myself an experienced teacher, but I want to uh, improve on that skill. And then I also chose a skill that I was interested in, but I didn't really know because I, I genuinely didn't have any uh, know-how of data science, data handling, data cleansing whatsoever. So do show that you're not afraid to try something new, but pick something that, you know, kind of fits with your application. So don't talk about data science if you uh, sell yourself as a very sort of, um, I don't know, someone who wants to do something very specific in immunology. Whereas if you sell yourself as a budding epidemiologist, maybe it's more, it's more relevant. That's what I'm trying to say. Try and tailor, tailor this advice to you guys. But um, I think, yeah, the main thing is don't be defensive, show that you want to learn and uh, try, try some examples that are relevant to, to the dinner you're applying to. And last question, how would you set out to answer a research question that has a reason from a clinical case you were involved in? Now, isn't it very tempting to talk about a very interesting case um, or to talk about something you've already done? Um, there's different schools of thought here, and I'm not going to tie you with this, um, but basically some people suggest, you know, going for something unique, say a case report, say um, like a, a systematic review with a specific protocol. I wouldn't go with that. I would go with something safe because these guys know what they're doing. They're experts. So... Um, if you've got mistakes or things you're uncertain of in the methodology, this is not great because it shows that you think you know, but you don't. Whereas if you, you admit that you don't know, and it's fine, like I'm, uh, I'm here, I don't know how to do um, systematic reviews uh, with all the details you know, that registrars or people above me do, just admit it and go for an RCT or go for something that, you know, I'm not going to say it's simpler, but the, the steps to do it are outlined and are out there and are safer. So I played it safe with this question. Initially, I had a case report, which was uh, for a very interesting condition that nobody sees. Then I thought they don't really care about that. They want to see whether I understand the research pathway. They don't care about what disease I've, I've encountered, right? So I went with an RCT. I chose a topic of interest and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Um, the first thing to do is look in the literature, see what's out there. Consider conducting a systematic review of, or meta-analysis. This is not the same. I'm not saying we're doing this to answer the question. I'm saying this is part of the question. Um, and by doing that, it will help us 
refine the question and determine what numbers we need. And then you go on to identify a principal investigator who is going to take this forward with you and going to lead it from there. Engage with the local trials units. So in Oxford, we have the Oxford Clinical Trials Unit um, and work jointly, develop a protocol. And uh, here you can, depending on whether you've got space or not, you can add some nice things to get some brownie points like identify the primary outcome. Yes, okay, that's good. Everyone does that, th does that but uh, not many people care about um, secondary outcomes uh, and their relevance to, the, to, the, to patients. And that's sad to see many papers, um, you know, get released and there are secondary outcomes which are not really, let me say, of arguable significance. Uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say is work with patients. Why not have a patient in the, in the board, right? And uh, ask them, you know, what's important for you guys? And try and identify secondary outcomes that are important to patients. Then uh, get approval from a research ethics committee. This is key. This, um, I know it sounds trivial. It did uh, with me as well. But then I looked it up and apparently it can take ages. Uh, it can take maybe four months, which would be your academic block, just to get research approval for big trials. So do write that down. It's a big step and sometimes delays the whole process. Uh, and finally, once you've done all that, you know, you, you write it, um, analyze data, write everything, and you aim to disseminate, so, sort of to spread this knowledge, either by publication or uh, presentations and conferences. And that's a good way to answer this question. Basically show that you've got a topic of interest and how you're going to take it from just an idea to something substantial and uh, give this information out to the people. Okay, um, this is the last question, I think, and then we've got plenty of time for questions. I, I've tried to keep this short. So, um, what should you be careful not to do when answering white space questions? A, present yourself positively. B, answering them without maxing the word count. C, planting questions for the interviewer to expand on your achievements. D, digging a hole for yourself on the interview day. And E, saying nice things about the deanery, uni, hospital, or wherever it is you are applying to. Yes, it's the um, important guys. Don't talk about, uh, you know, advanced treatments if you're not sure. Um, I've had this happen to a friend of mine um, who talked about CAR T-cell therapies and... Uh, he got asked on the interview because the, the interview didn't want to catch him out. The interviewer just wanted to see this guy's interest. And uh, um, my friend didn't really know. So um, he wasn't prepared for this. He was too busy preparing for the other stuff. So make sure you, whatever you write on the white space questions, you're confident with um, because it, they could ask you at any moment. Okay. And uh, I have a summary slide um before we go so most important things for on this presentation rewrite reread and resend start early don't start too early i mean i for um uh the deaners that i applied for one of them i started too early and they changed the white space questions which was a bit frustrating but for many deaners the white space questions stay the same or they don't change so yeah draft it as many times as possible this is the best tip really give it to your friends have it looked over with a different pair of eyes and just take the recommendations on board. Um, try and start early, but again, not too early. I think now was a good time for, for my year, for last year. I don't know about you guys, because of COVID, maybe everything will be pushed back. So don't panic. Um, check when the white space questions 2020 are out and start drafting them soon. And um, that's it. Enjoy your advantage on interview day. What I mean by that is, you know, having uh, good white space questions is, is, is half the job because some deaneries actually look at the white space questions on interview. Most, or at least so they say, um, they don't look at the white space questions and interviews a plain uh, a level playing field. But uh, from my experience, uh, some deaneries do look at your white space questions. So if you've done a good job, you're already a step, step ahead of the game, so you're ready to crush your interview, guys. So, um, 
I would be very grateful if you could um, scan this and provide some feedback from things I didn't do so well and things you'd like to hear from other speakers in the future, what we can improve on. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions you have by um, email and I'll answer any questions you have here. And I see there's, there's not too many of you. So um, I think if you want me to have a look at your white space questions, I'm happy to do so guys. If it's too many of you and it starts getting overwhelming, uh, then I might, with your permission, share them with friends who apply to different deaneries. So, without further ado, let's have a look at the questions. Could you answer this question with something you've already done? I, you answered your own research questions. Um, Show case how you went about it. Uh, could you answer this question with something? I'm not sure about which question this is. Is this for the um, for the final white space question where we talk about um, the this one? Set out a how how did you go about setting out a research question to? Oh, chat. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's about this one. Um, you've already done. Yes. So yes, you can answer it with something you've already done. Um, just be aware um, you need to demonstrate that you know how the treatment path, the, the sort of uh, research pathway works. So don't focus on having done it. Just say, you know, that that's, that's what it is. Uh, and then I went through these steps and then we achieved this and uh, published it and, you know, all, all those nice things. Basically, you can basically um, sort of paraphrase along the lines of this framework and insert your personal example, basically. Um, yeah. So I hope this answers your question. Um, let me know if it doesn't. There's a couple, couple of things in chat. How do you answer the leadership question, which is superimposed on the teamwork question? Good question. Let me have a look. Which one is this um, on the teamwork question? Oh, so it's probably this one. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, so um, wait, let me just double check. This is the right one. Yes, this is the one. So um, yeah, that's a good point uh, because this is just part of, uh, of the question uh, and you don't want to spend all of it talking about leadership, but you do want to mention it. So I, I'm going to say what I did for this one. Um, it, it'll be different for everyone, but focus on the hurdles, focus on what I've learned, and then somewhere there, throw in an example of leadership. So the leadership for me in this scenario was that you know, it was a big language barrier, um, experiments worked, and then that would be it. But I thought, you know why, you know what, it's interesting. So why not take it a step further? So I volunteered and uh, spoke to the team and said, you know, guys, I'm, I'm thinking about writing this. Would you be happy uh, to contribute? And they said, yes. Uh, and I took the lead of the publication. So I wrote the manuscript. Um, and then reviewed it with uh, the rest of the team. And then I led the submission and then it got published and then led a presentation in the UK. Um, so these sorts of things. Um, so sort of, yeah, leadership examples from the main example. Um, so yeah, a research project is a good example in, in that sense. Um, Yes, uh, contact details. Yes, uh, uh, I'm happy to, to review your white space questions, guys. Um, contact details wise, I'm not quite sure what's going on because this is being recorded, but you can either get them through becoming a doctor or um, because it's not many of you live at the moment, uh, we can arrange this uh, Yeah, after, after the, the recording. Anything else I've missed? For the leadership question, can it be non-research based, leading a society or charity? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's a good example. 
um, because if you say you are in the Royal Society of Medicine or say you're president of a student society um, and you've led a conference or led an event, that's a great example. It doesn't have to be research-based um, and actually variety is good. So if you've put research examples somewhere else, yeah, go, go with that, absolutely. Uh, do you have a Twitter handle? Yes, I'm happy to. Yeah, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, being a teacher is my answer for the leadership and teaching. What do I do mm -hmm. for my leadership and teaching? So, um, I'm not quite sure if you mean, so this question says, being a teacher is my answer for the leadership and teaching. What do I do? So, first of all, I'm not sure where you want to apply. If you want to apply to a dinner that has two separate questions, then it depends whether this is one example. If it's one example and you absolutely have no other examples, it's perfectly fine. You just need to make sure that you discuss this in two different, two, two very different scopes uh, to answer two different questions. I'm not saying present it as two different occasions, but you're going to present the teaching aspect on the one question and the leadership aspect on the, on the other question, which is fine. I'd say if you have another example, albeit slightly weaker, maybe go with the other example uh, because you can still get away with putting some teaching stuff into the leadership question or vice versa. So you can really nail down that one question going all the way with that good example. But if you don't have two examples, you can, you can split it, uh, but be transparent about it. Any more questions? Southwest, they also ask about uh, student select component as a question and research experience as a question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, could you clarify? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to talk about SEC in my research question. So there's a lot of overlap. So uh, they ask about SEC as a question and research experience as a question. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I'd say that's probably um, a good amount of overlap, uh, but it's all about how you say it. So this is the same example. So you can't really go from different uh, directions, so to speak. But if you've done extensive research, you can sort of really focus on the research per se on the, on the one part and then on the other part, talk about, um, is it teaching or? No, it's, it's, it's your, your SEC. Um, or maybe do, do two different examples. I'd say two different examples, yeah. Um, if not, if not possible, and you've got one research example, then mention it, that this was your SEC and you did that. Um, the questions will be slightly different, so just pick up on the cues and the questions. I'm afraid I don't have them in front of me for the Southwest, but um, it's fine to use the same example as long as you don't basically copy and paste the same answer. Just try and get a, a slightly different perspective. Intercalate degree for research, but this was more of a dissertation. Um, and then SEC for the SEC question. Oh, um, oh, so you, you have an IBSC. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I completely with you, that's what I'd do. I would do the IBSC in one question and the SEC in the other question. That sounds, uh, that sounds more varied, yeah. As I said, happy to review them. Um, oh no, I IBSC of course counts as, uh, as uh, research, yeah. Any type of research. Um, 
summer research, summer placements, years off where you've done research, research during your IBSC, research during an SEC, um, systematic reviews um, you've done during medical school, collaboratives, anything, um, anything. But yeah, as I said, happy to, to review the questions. Um, if, uh, if you want me to, um, I'll review the white space questions. What sort of non-academic things are they looking at? Um, yeah, it's difficult at what you classify as academic. <laughs> uh, not a sports person, so I'm stuck. Don't worry. <laughs> Um, I don't think I mentioned that I was part of like a football team, um, which I was for a very brief period of time. So it wouldn't be a good example. Um, so yeah, it depends what you classify as academic. Um, so if if it's not research uh, and stuff, you can list other extracurriculars. So arts, whether you're into drawing, painting, whether you're into playing music, whether um, whether you're into, you know, social um, societies or different types of societies, um, what did I pick? Would be it would be a helpful example to list. I can't remember which question that was because um, I don't think I answered this question. Uh, maybe it's different. It's for a different deanery. Um, but everyone's done different things, so. Uh, what would I have picked? Um, I am actually starting a philosophy podcast. So if I were doing my white space questions now, um, that's what I would have picked. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure what the question is. But um, yeah, tr if they want something broader, try for a, an art society, sports society, uh, maybe charity um, that you're involved in. Um, anything like that. Would you say we should link the white space question answers? Um, I see what you mean. Good question and thank you for that because I was meaning to mention this. Um, yes and no. So you don't want a lot of overlap, but you also don't want to appear like someone who wants to do research in oncology, orthopedics, ophthalm, uh, and whatever else starts with an O at the same time. Um, so you want to have a direction. It's fine if you don't know what you want to do, uh, but just be honest and say, this is of interest to me. You don't want to sound confused and uh, go through all different um, approaches. So what I would suggest say, let's take the example of global health. If you want to do global health, Pick something that your application is strong at. So let's say you were president of your global health society at your university. We're usually good at things we like. So you usually have, have some sort of involvement to, to what you want to do. So pick that. And then this will be kind of a recurring theme. So uh, maybe for question one, say that Oxford is good in terms of global health. So that's why you want to come. Question two, you'll have an example where you were a leader or a researcher in global health. Question five, which is about designing a research project. It could be a global health question. So I'd say it's good to have a kind of recurring theme, but don't repeat yourself in terms of what you put in the answers. Um, chat. How you explain the rationale for choosing this program? If you're in between two programs, for example, psych and anesthetics. Um, so uh, again, it depends on what program, but go on the, on, the, on the strengths of the individual program. So let's say you want to apply to Cambridge and, um, or actually no, let's say you want to apply to Imperial uh, and Imperial has a very good anesthetics department. So you can say that, that you want to work at Mary's, St. Mary's Hospital, and you're going to see a lot of cases, um, work with eminent consultants and, um, you know, do some research as well that they do in surgery and anesthesia. Um, and they're pioneers in many stuff, uh, many other stuff in anesthetics down there. So 
so yeah try and link it if you're stuck between two different specialties you want to apply both for anesthetics and psych i'd say probably go for one it's fine you can mention your interest but you don't want to sound too dilute in terms of interest just go for one and then um on the day of the interview you can tell them that you know um what i actually like more than one specialty and uh you can pick your program as well so when you rank the academic programs, try and get something that has both psych and anesthetics and see which, um, which deaneries offer what. For example, I don't think London offers orthopedics. So if you want to do orthopedics, uh, if that was a must for you as an F1 or an F2, you wouldn't apply to, uh, say, London for an academic foundation program. Um, you would apply to Oxbridge, for example, or other academic foundation programs. <coughs> Um, is it good to name drop professors and supervisors? Mm. Right, yes. Um, I get asked this a lot of times. It's good, especially when you're doing an interview. It's good to say, you know what, I've uh, <clears throat> been in touch with X, X's lab and uh, if I get accepted, I'm going to do this and that. Uh, in terms of white space questions, don't spend too much time. Just talk about the department they work in. If you have the word count, feel free to drop their name. It's, it's fine, but don't see it as, a, as an advantage. You won't, you won't get the spot because the person who's reviewing this is friends with the, with the supervisor. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But during an interview, it can get you an advantage because you seem organized. You're that kind of person who, even before getting a position, has approached someone who works in that department to ask them for a research project. So see it like that. It shows that you're organized and it shows that you know that you want to do something specific, say some ortho or some dermatology research and you've targeted that department. So yeah, if you have the space, why not do it? Um, do they care about deciles and individual ranking for each module? Um, this is getting more uh, general AFP rather than white space questions, but yeah, sure, I, I can answer to the best of my ability. So it depends on the deanery. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you about individual modules. Ranking is important. So I know in my year, many people who applied to London and weren't in the top four deciles, maybe uh, three or four, it depends. They got like a rejection email two days afterwards, uh, after the application deadline. Uh, which was dreadful because they have so many applications in London, so they screen based on deciles. I can tell you for Oxford and Cambridge, which is where I applied and where I wanted to be, that people get shortlisted from deciles um, lower than fifth or sixth. Um, I know people uh, who weren't on the top of their class and they've got interviews, so they do look at you as a person rather than a number. Um, and that's probably the case with many other deaneries, uh, um, apart from Oxford and Cambridge, but these are the only two I know. So don't be put off if you have a low decile ranking. I know it's not fair, but that's how they work to cut down applications. I would just say don't, don't apply to London if you're maybe below the fifth decile. Uh, it changes every year. Sometimes fourth decile will get in. I think for our year, fourth decile didn't get in. But fifth decile um, for London, the competition is fierce. So if you're at seven decile below, Oxford may accept. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know a case. I know, I know, I know a person who um, got an interview. Um, so go for it. Absolutely go. If you don't apply, you're not going to get it. If you're tenth decile, it doesn't matter. Um, it's this is the door for the integrated academic clinical pathway, which means that some people end up doing half research, half clinical work. Some people end up becoming fully academic. So don't let your clinical grade define you. Um, they're looking into other attributes as well. Your clinical grade counts in that, you know, um, short listing score, but a lot of other things count as well. Oxbridge have 10 spaces for publications, uh, many for presentations. So lots of things count. If you have a PhD, that's always a plus. Don't bother with London if fifth decile then, or is it worth risking it? Okay, guys, I don't want to take anyone um, 
uh, I don't want to give any advice that is going to sort of risk um, your your future. And if you don't dis if you if you disagree with me, uh, I don't want to sort of force you to do anything. This is my personal opinion, and this is not my opinion actually. It's it's what happened in my year. What happened in my year? People who were below the fourth decile weren't considered at all. Sometimes it's people who are below the third decile. If you're in the top 30% of your class, definitely apply. If you're in the top 40% of, of your class, maybe apply. It's, it's up to you. It's up to you. Uh, if you're torn, I'd say, and you're in the top 40% and you wouldn't mind being somewhere outside of London, apply outside of London. You only get two applications, don't burn them. If you really want London and you're fourth decile, do it because it's best to regret for things that you've done. You know, uh, what if you spend your whole life thinking about, oh, I should have, I should have done that. At the end of the day, it's just an AFP, guys. It's just two years. It's, it's not much different. It depends whether location is more important than research for you. Um, so it, it's completely down to you. But fifth decile in London, it's hard. People who do the London AFP will encourage you to apply, and that's correct because you should believe in it and uh, you, you may stand a chance, but from my experience, the last two or three years, people below the fourth decile didn't get an offer. How long did it take you to write the white space uh, from start to finish? Um, I don't remember because it, it was on and off. I would send it to friends via email or messenger and see their comments. So actual time sitting down and writing them, I, I couldn't quantify, um, but it takes time. Um, it takes time. Don't look at it as time lost because you look at your CV, you look at what you've done and you get organized and you're going to have to do that as an F1 and F2. So you're a step ahead of the game. So um, I'd say do it. Not all places have six white space questions. Cambridge does. Oxford had five. Some places have three, um, some two. London doesn't have any. So um, take the time and do it if you're considering applying because again, it's better to regret for something you did than for something you didn't do. That's my opinion, at least. Um, yeah, for what that's worth. I hope, I hope this is helpful, guys. Let's have a look, chat. I don't think there are any other questions. So if there's no other questions, anyone, uh, last call for questions, I take it this is, feel free to message me on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'll be in touch with Becoming a Doctor to release my details. Um, I just didn't do it because it's on stream, but you can message them and uh, get my email and send them uh, individually and I can have a look at the white space questions particularly Oxbridge, um, I'm happy to help. Um, other deaneries, again, I could uh, forward them to people who know. Um, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you for spending 50 minutes of your afternoon with me, which is slightly worrying. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure you all have something better to do now. So thank you for your time and uh, yeah, be in touch. Good luck. <laughs>